Hey everyone, it's Jonathan, and today we're following up our episode from last week with the sequel I didn't even know existed until we started this series. Growing up, 1995's The Wind in the Willows was one of a handful of VHS tapes my family had, and we watched it to death. It's always been one of my favorites because of that. So I was kind of shocked when I started researching for this podcast series that it had a sequel that I had never heard of. 1996's The Willows in Winter is based on a sequel not written by Kenneth Graham. There were several other novels continuing the adventures of Rat, Mole, Toad, and Badger, written many years after Kenneth Graham's death by another author, William Horwood. And all of this was news to me, so it was very interesting going into this one. Excited to see more adventures with the characters I'd grown up with, but also slightly wary knowing that it wasn't written by the original author. Joining me once more for this one is my cousin Sarah. She ended up really liking the one I grew up with, both because it accurately captured the essence of the characters, but also because it was made by one of her favorite filmmakers, John Coates, who also made this one. So really, this one had everything going for it going in. Except the source material. <laughs> Okay, shall we get on to this monstrosity? <laughs> it had some moments that I enjoyed, but on the whole, I kept scratching my head like, this was a choice. Okay, so I start out, I, I love you, John Coates. I start out watching this thinking, okay, this is, I don't know, kind of like Tales from Avon Lee. <laughs> It's the characters. It's a total spin. It's not the it's not the Ellen Montgomery stories, but it's still nice. And then I got part way through and it's like, what the heck? <laughs> oh, this is so oh. Like I don't want to be mean because it's John Coates and I want to be a nice person, but this was a mistake. <laughs> Well, I didn't realize that this was based on another book. Really? Apparently, there's an, an English novelist named William Horwood who's done a ton of books. Like, he was born in the 40s, and I think he might still... I think he's still alive, and he's still writing. This was fan fiction. That's what I thought as I was watching. I was like, this basically seems like fan fiction. <laughs> Leave it alone. <laughs> I mean, you, this is what you do with the fan fiction? You're killing everybody off and starting <laughs> fires? Or one fire. But anyway. Yeah, he was born in 44. He's 79, so. And he felt like chaos. <laughs> he's he's written, he wrote four, in the 90s, he wrote four sequels to Wind in the Willows. Willows in Winter, Toad Triumphant, The Willows and Beyond, and The Willows at Christmas. The Willows at Christmas sounds cozy, but I don't know if it would be. I guess it depends on how closely they stuck to the book with this movie. I love the little world of him being with Rat. And so he's gone back to his house. They're still friends or whatever. And then mm. you have this random nephew. And <laughs> then this whole... <laughs> that was the first head-scratching moment. Well, no, not a bad head-scratching moment. I was like... Okay, a nephew? Okay. <laughs> that nobody is that excited to have around, apparently. This is like when they just give random Disney characters a nephew. <laughs> what happened in this guy's life that he wanted to write in a nephew that nobody really wanted around? <laughs> that, that was also confusing, because they say at the beginning that he was recently orphaned. Yeah. Although he sounds like he's an adult. So, but he needs somewhere to live, which I okay, fine. But then it seems like everybody's annoyed with him. So <laughs> like like they don't you want gotta him there. Pick one. Either he's vacationing and he's annoying, or he's an orphan and you need to be compassionate. Just pick one. <laughs> um, this will be a more lively episode, probably because of all of the complaining <laughs> that I have to do about this. And okay, so Portly shows Portly, right? Yeah, shows up. Like there's some kind of an emergency and then the nephew gives him too much booze to revive him or whatever and then he doesn't get the message out properly because he's going off into a drunken sleep. And so Mole goes off like there's an emergency, which this seems fairly accurate to life. There was no emergency. This is a stupid mix-up. <laughs> and uh, then he ends up, you know, crashing through... An icy river, which at night, 
But no, he's not dead. <laughs> but he left a will. <laughs> I was like, when did he write a will? And why would you take it with you? Yes. <laughs> leave it in a convenient place at the cottage for someone to find. Don't leave it in a hollow tree to be found 50 years later or whatever. Um, <laughs> that was, the will was my first indication that this is, this is a downgrade from the first movie. <laughs> Okay, I think you caught on faster than I did. <laughs> With the will, it's like, okay, they're going out to search for him. Oh, he just randomly left a will when he went to search for his friends who maybe might be in it, trouble. Maybe keep it on your body. So that when they, f I don't know. Yeah, just leave it at the house, bud. Just leave it at the house. <laughs> Who's gonna? Is Portly gonna tamper with it? Is he gonna? Does he want all your stuff? Does he want your little cockle shell fountain thing? Yeah, he should have been dead, but he wasn't. Maybe that's me being overly dramatic. But if you fell into, I a, thought the same thing. Yeah, if you fell into an icy river at night, you're dead. I There's know. basically no hope. Unless you're, uh, you know. Maybe Pen protected him. Oh yeah. Well, see, they could. He could have written that in. That could have been a whole thing. It could have been. It actually would have made more sense than he just somehow yeah, survived. Like protector of little animals. <laughs> and so everybody's got to start up a search party. And of course, we have a side story, uh, or not? Of course, we have a side story with Toad wanting to be an aviator and being a little zit about it. <laughs> that actually cracked me up, though. We we did skip over the beginning because. Well, first we start with Vanessa Redgrave and her grandchildren again. She They come to visit, and she says she has a winter story for them. But when she starts talking, she's talking about the summertime, where Toad is hosting Mole's nephew. Mm -hmm. And he's teaching him to play croquet. And then a plane flies over, and he's, like, glazing over. And he tells Nephew Mole, you better pack your bags. <laughs> that cracked me up. <laughs> Which does not make sense. <laughs> like, you could take up flying and, and still have him off in the library or whatever. I should also mention, though, too, I wrote it down because I thought you would be interested. Nephew Mole is voiced by Adrian Scarborough, who I'm not very familiar with, but he voiced Benjamin Bunny in the world of Peter Rabbit and Friends. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Not old Mr. Bouncer, but young Benjamin. He was in a lot of British series, so I know I've either heard or seen him in other things, but it, there was nothing where I was like, that's where I know him from. Like, he was in a random episode of Doctor Who or something, so I know I've seen him, but he wasn't ever a main character in something. Mm. More recognizable to me. The guy helping him with flying was being so nice, so, un yeah, trying to flatter him and keep him from killing himself or something. Yeah, with the search party, they decide, well, they see Toad fly overhead, because you have this whole thing with Toad. He's not allowed to fly the airplane himself. I, get, I don't know. They must need like need a pilot's license or something. He, and also, he hasn't had any training. So he's got this pilot, and he's telling him that he needs he needs people to see him flying his plane. <laughs> so they come up with this thing where the pilot's going to be like ducked down out of sight or something, mm -hmm. so that Toad can be the only one visible. So they see Toad fly over and decide that they're going to get him to help search for Mole, which is actually very logical, because mm -hmm. that would be a much better way than just searching on foot. I should also say, they recruited all the Wildwood animals, because... You okay. gotta have a search party. <laughs> I was like, I wouldn't trust these people. <laughs> but I, I guess they threatened them into helping and promised them a party also. Also, I don't know if the, this is supposed to be a character from the book, but it seemed like Badger had a little hedgehog servant. Which is not in the... I mean, in the book, you have the two hedgehogs that were on their way to school that end up at his house having breakfast. But they don't... they're not his servants. I couldn't, I couldn't figure out if the, they were supposed to be his servants or not, because... or this one, at least, seemed to be helping, but he never said anything, and he was just kind of there. So I was like, okay, did Badger get a servant sometime in the past couple of years between movies? 
I never know. And this is where I started to get, like, mad. <laughs> because Toad was more concerned about showing off and getting his own way and didn't really seem to care about Mole, which you can try and write that off as he maybe doesn't understand how serious the situation is. But he was being so obnoxious. It's like somebody needs to step on him and end it. Just kill the toad. <laughs> kill the toad. Sarah's murderous side comes out. This was ridiculous. He wants to be messing around up in the sky being obnoxious after he's taken the clothes from the other aviator who actually knows what he's doing. I will say, though, the scene where he tricks him into going into the little shed and you just have the silhouette of the toad jumping on his head. That, 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 that was probably my biggest laugh of the entire movie. That's good you enjoyed that. There was a lot about Toad's antics that, devoid of the context of him being a selfish jerk, cracked me up. You might have actually enjoyed it when you were 12 or something. <laughs> probably. <laughs> that probably would have helped me enjoy this movie more now if I'd had nostalgia blinders to put on. But since I didn't know this one existed until I started researching for the podcast, <laughs> I don't have the nostalgia blinders on. So I can only say that Toad sometimes made me laugh, but for the most part, this was a much reverted and even worse Toad than the first movie. Yes, no, he needed to die. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm glad that you were able to, you were probably laughing at stuff that I wasn't, where I was just sitting there feeling frustrated. <laughs> and then what, the, then you have Rat falling out of the plane. Is it just me, or did that just feel... Dr I mean, in real life, it would be drawn out, but it's like, uh, he's falling and falling and falling. It seemed like they were trying to do... Maybe not recreate the thing with Pan, but sort of give Rhett, I don't know, a spiritual experience. Like, he right, had a near-death like experience like he, or like something. Like he had seen the afterlife, and nobody wanted to listen to him, and that mm -hmm. was pretty much it. And also he had the scene where he's like sitting on the riverbank communing with the river or something. Yeah. Which, at, when that happened, I was like, okay, I guess that sort of tracks from his attitude from the first one. Yeah. But then the near-death experience was like, okay, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> that seemed weird, but also Pan was in the first movie, so I shouldn't, <laughs> I shouldn't think too hard about it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's less out there to have the near-death experience of seeing the animal afterlife which <laughs> however fanciful you want to be for the story i but should also say too i completely forgot when we're talking about the pilot the pilot is voiced by mike grady who played barry on the last of the summer wine <laughs> really oh that did not register <laughs> it didn't to me until i looked him up <laughs> barry oh, barry and also chief weasel was voiced by mark lockyer who played Peter Rabbit in the world of Beatrix Potter and Friends. Really? <laughs> He's a versatile actor. <laughs> How many years were between those two roles? Like two. What the heck? <laughs> He's a versatile actor. Did he go through puberty between them or what happened? I don't know. That's just what it said on, I think, IMDb. I'm vaguely confused. Because he has a boy... Not a man voice, but a boy voice for Peter Rabbit. And I'm assuming, and I can't remember the Chief Weasel's voice now, but I'm assuming that it's nothing like... Well, the episode that he voices Peter Rabbit in is not the story of Peter Rabbit. It's the tale of Mr. Todd. Is he an adult in that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, that makes more sense. <laughs> Yeah, no, he'd grown up and he was helping Benjamin Bunny, whose babies had been kidnapped by a badger, mm. Mr. Badger. Okay, a different Mr. Badger. <laughs> yes, a bad Mr. Badger. Well, an animal, you know. <laughs> but yeah, after Rat is dumped out of the plane, everyone is understandably basically enraged at Mr. Toad, and they're all shouting, you can go hang. And then they kind of not forget about him, but they don't bother going to look for him because he ends up crashing 
It should be noted that um, Rat did have a parachute that he finally pulled yes. at some point. Yes. Thankfully, he had the presence of mind to put that on before. <laughs> Either before they took off or maybe he found it in the plane. Either way, he knew he needed it. <laughs> Eventually, after he'd fallen and fallen. Mm -hmm. Over probably not that great of a height on the English countryside, but um, okay. Anyways, Toad ends up crashing in a greenhouse. I think, I don't remember where the plane ends up, but everybody talks about it like the pilot saved the town by crashing where he did. So the plane doesn't end up in the greenhouse, but Toad ends up in the greenhouse. Which is a magnificent greenhouse. Yeah, it's like full of jungle plants. It looks like a really cool place to visit. Yes. And I kind of liked the way they had, you know, you have the, uh, apparently belongs to the judge, so okay, enter the judge again. <laughs> and isn't a cleric with him and somebody else? Yeah, I, I don't remember who his other friend was. I like how they have it, like they're, the guy is trying to identify creatures yes. <laughs> in, the, in the conservatory or the greenhouse, and he's up there sort of swiveling around. <laughs> Yeah, he, he also had a parachute, but now he's trapped in a tree in the greenhouse, just kind of flailing and not able to move. But I liked the way they were talking about how he must have large creatures in the greenhouse to fertilize the plants. <laughs> <laughs> and Toad hears this not knowing they're talking about him, and he freaks out thinking there's something that could eat him. Mm. And he has a line about... It being better to die in a dungeon than eaten alive by whatever's in this greenhouse. So he starts yelling for help, telling them that he's a pilot who had an accident. And then they think he's the local hero who made sure that his plane didn't crash into the town. But he insists that he has to keep on his aviation clothes, otherwise he'll somehow die or something. <laughs> so that he won't be recognized his, by his, the judge. His explanation for that made so little sense because he's 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 like it's for it's for health oxygen in the blood you know it's like okay and the judge just buys this in this world yes <laughs> meanwhile through all this obviously mole is not dead he's somehow survived which still makes not relatively little sense but Okay, whatever. There's a boat had slipped away from Rat and all of them somehow. That that was that scene that was one where I first raised my eyes. I was like, okay, Rat just forgets to tie up his boat. That seems very out of character for Rat. But then I was like, well, he lost his friend, so he's not he's thinking upset. straight. <laughs> but yeah, this boat he lost earlier in the movie now makes its way to Mole so that he can have a way back to his friends. But meanwhile, for some reason, this is still like the very next day, Badger goes to find Rat after he falls out of the airplane and basically just says, we need to plan a funeral for Mole. <laughs> I was like, they jumped straight from Mole got lost last night to he's dead, we need to hold a funeral. <laughs> Which honestly, is probably fairly realistic in that setting. It just seemed so quick. It was like the next day. It was like, well, that's it. Disney princess marriage quick. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> so they basically jump straight to a funeral, and you have Badger giving the eulogy, and you've got Portly there upset, saying this is all his fault, which... <laughs> kind of. Yeah, it is. <laughs> kind of, like, not totally, but kind of is. So he's kind of wandering off, apparently eating a cracker to soothe his wounded spirit. <laughs> and it's understandable. Mole comes ashore in Rath's rowboat with a sheet on him for whatever reason. Maybe it was a tarp for the boat. Maybe. But, but he looks like a ghost. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so Portly panics and runs back to the funeral where everybody panics except for Badger, who was, like, ordering the spirit to leave so they could finish the funeral. <laughs> mm. and then, Seems fairly in character. <laughs> and then Mole reveals himself, and everyone's relieved he's not dead. And he, isn't he hungry? Yes. 
meanwhile, Toad is now recuperating at the judge's house, <laughs> taking full advantage of lavish meals. I hated the way he treated... <laughs> uh, hate is a strong word. <laughs> hate is a strong word. I did not like the way he treated the butler. He was so obnoxious. Yes. I thought that I maybe recognized Prendergast's voice. I looked him up and I, I saw his face on IMDb and I was like, he does look vaguely familiar. So I started going through all the lines. This is Peter Sellier or maybe Sellier. He played the major on Keeping Up Appearances. <laughs> Was that the one who was always chasing after Heisen? Yes. Oh, my. <laughs> Apparently he was only in three episodes. I could have sworn he was in more than that. Very memorable. <laughs> Didn't she want to, like, befriend him because he had status? Yes. And then he she, was obnoxious. She could not stand him, but he had status, so she put up with him. <laughs> I don't know how long he stays in bed, but it's at least a day, and you finally have the judge sending Prendergast up to insist that he come down to dinner so they can properly reward him for his heroism. And he doesn't want to do this because they'll figure out who he is. So <laughs> he comes up with this harebrained scheme, which is like a... I don't know how he figured out that this was going to work. It's almost Rube Goldbergian in the way he put this together. He blocks up the fireplace so that Prendergast will get a chimney sweep. So then the chimney sweep can come in there and he can get the sweep drunk so that he can steal his clothes and escape. So they just assume that this is the pilot still injured. <laughs> and everybody thinks he's this magnificent fallen hero. And now Toad is furious that someone would take his glory. <laughs> <laughs> so he blows his own cover <laughs> so stupid <laughs> this is another thing where it made me laugh with how dumb it was even though for the story it made, just Toad should not be acting like this because he should have he should be more reformed than this there should be more fear and trepidation and, and just getting out of there yes so then you've got everybody chasing him, and he steals a bike and rides on down the road. And he finds a house and is taken in by a woman who briefly mistakes him for her husband. He stole the chimney sweep's bike. She thinks that he's the chimney sweep. But, but how did he find the chimney sweep's house? Like, how did he know? Like, it, it, made, it kind of made no sense that he would just happen to steal the chimney sweep's clothes and bike and everybody thinks he's a chimney sweep and then he finds himself at the chimney sweep's house and now his own wife thinks that the toad is the chimney sweep briefly until she see, gets a better look at his face. It seemed too convoluted and convenient. I mean, it's fan fiction, so you yes, can do it exactly. <laughs> that, 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 I kept thinking that with stuff like this would happen. I was like, this really is just fan fiction. <laughs> <laughs> so while Toad is wandering the woods, everybody is planning on working on this party that Badger had promised the weasels. They end up going to Toad Hall to borrow some stuff. I think my mind disconnected from the promised party and them actually having the promised party. <laughs> it's like, okay, they're having a party. Uh... They find that the house is now flooded due to a burst pipe, and basically the place is trashed. Ratty finds a letter with an American postmark for Toad, so he picks it up to save it for him. But then everybody else decides that he's dead, and now they're going to hold this party in his memory. <laughs> the death wind in the willows <laughs> apparently everybody's <laughs> sort of dying but not really yeah and meanwhile toad now finds himself at a wedding where he's still dressed as a chimney sweep and apparently sweeps is good luck at weddings as someone says <laughs> are they really i don't know i feel like i've heard that before so maybe that's some sort of old superstition mm. So he decides to just lean into this chimney sweep thing. He's talking himself <sighs> up, <laughs> completely yeah. unaware <laughs> that the groom is the son of the judge. <laughs> Another convenience for this story. <laughs> well, and then the daughter is what the the sheriff's 
daughter or something. Uh, I think commissioner. The, the, the priest had a line about no hope for criminals now, no clemency, hang them all. <laughs> and like the camera zooming in on his face. <laughs> oh boy. And Toad was so obnoxious at this wedding. He was wanting yeah. to steal the camera's attention. Yeah, he's posing for pictures with the family when the wife from the night before bursts in, screaming that he's pretending to be her missing husband, which alerts the judge who turns around and spots him, and he's now finally caught. So then you get a line from Vanessa Redgrave saying that winter is ending with no news of Toad. It is now spring, and Badger is reading the paper and finds a story about Toad. Apparently, everyone thinks he murdered the chimney sweep. <laughs> Which just... Because why not? <laughs> At that point, I was like, what? The chimney sweep was last seen drunkenly stumbling around the judge's house. <laughs> you would think that they would know where the chimney sweep was. Why is the judge prosecuting Toad for the murder of a man who is living in his own house? <laughs> Ish. So Bowger tells everybody about this, and Rat says something like, Toad is incapable of murder. And I'd like to that Bowger chimed in, manslaughter, perhaps. <laughs> Would that be like accidentally? <laughs> kind of. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's fully capable of that. <laughs> and Rat also points out that there's no mention in the article of his airplane. So, really, the thing that he is in trouble for is murder, which is so ridiculous. So, for some reason, Badger decides he needs to help Toad. I don't know why. I mean, going to jail for murder is rather serious, so if he can help That's true. That's true. So, he writes a letter to an old friend of his, the editor of The Times which is apparently a huge deal. I'm guessing it's not the New York Times. It must be a different Times. It's the London Times. So Toad ends up in court, where he is basically manipulated into giving up his rights to a lawyer, and he pleads guilty to all 116 charges. Were all of the people he was facing rather homely, obnoxious? Like, yes. the way they drew them? Yes. Whatever weird skin tone they wanted to give them. <laughs> Yes. At this point, he actually finally seems like he's sorry for everything, and he's crying and confessing to having abandoned the search for Mole and possibly killed Ratty, because I don't think he even really knows if Ratty survived the fall. So <laughs> apparently... It took a while for that conscience to <laughs> kick in. That's what I was thinking. I was like, he went through all this stuff, and he's now looking back at the, the events of that day. He's like, Oh, yeah, I think I might have killed my friend. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Forgot about that while I, mean, I was gotta, scarfing chicken in bed. <laughs> you got to give him credit for whatever he's managed to... Oh, man. So all of his confessions confuse the court because nothing he's confessing to is what they have as his charges. They have no idea what he's talking about. And... <laughs> The judge accuses him of impersonating a pilot in order to steal his silver. <laughs> Which, what, have, what have these people been taking? I don't know. This, of course, infuriates Toad because he insists he is a pilot and he has plenty of silver of his own. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I don't remember exactly what he says. It was something like g telling him to go to the devil or something, which basically seals his fate. He's done for. But then suddenly a letter from the Times editor is delivered <laughs> in the middle of court proceedings for whatever reason. It's all so contrived. Uh, this letter reveals that both he and Badger are vouching for the Toad's good character. And then Prendergast shows up and testifies on Toad's behalf. Prendergast, After... who he had given money to <laughs> previously, so... Uh, I suppose that's why, <laughs> that <laughs> even though had, he mistreated him. May have had something to do, probably a lot to do with that. Yeah. 
But then Prendergast also reveals that the person he has supposedly murdered is actually alive and working for the judge as a chef in his kitchen and has taken up with the housekeeper, the widow Coggins. And the, the wife of the missing man is in court and screams, If he's alive, I'll murder him! <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what is this movie? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And basically after this, Prendergast reminds everybody that Toad saved the town, even if it was an accident. And then somehow he's just completely pardoned for everything. Well, the judge was acting like he wouldn't get reelected or wouldn't get some promotion or something <laughs> if he didn't let him off. There's some little mumbled, I think, about that. And yeah. So then apparently the party is only just now finally happening. So this is like months later. <laughs> it's like it took a really long time to put this party together. And you've got the weasels talking about Toad being seen wandering in rags, completely barmy. <laughs> and Badger insists it's not their Toad. And then one of the, the chief weasels like steals a spoon or something, and Badger right. chases him out. That made me laugh. Just the way they animated him <laughs> grab one. <laughs> <laughs> and then you got the scene of Toad finally returning to Toad Hall, horrified to find everything in ruins. I, I loved his line, my sofa, yes. and it showed off my legs so well. <laughs> yes, that might have been the thing that, that I found the most amusing <laughs> on, in this whole movie. <laughs> I was not expecting that line. <laughs> and then you've got him sobbing about having nothing, and he'll be reduced to working at the poorhouse or something. And then he finds a tin of biscuits and a bottle of wine and a candle and suddenly cheers up, I guess, because he at least has something. And meanwhile, the party is apparently boring and dull, and Badger reluctantly tells Portly that he can put on his newfangled tunes, fetch me my earplugs, mm -hmm. and Portly looks overjoyed and puts on ragtime music. <laughs> <laughs> I liked that that was the newfangled tunes that he needed earplugs for. Yeah, that, that <laughs> seems rather fitting with that character. He was trying to have a funeral dinner, in a sense. Or at least he was trying to have a moment, like one song. I guess maybe that is why the party was dull, because he did say it was like in memory of Toad, even though they have found out that he's still alive. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Maybe maybe Badger just wanted to insist that he was dead. He's dead to him. I don't know. <laughs> even though he vouched for him. And this is where it got even more ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. You have Toad on his balcony, he hearing created. the music from the party, assuming everybody hates him gets drunk, knocks over a candle, and sets the entire mansion on fire. This is good for kids. <laughs> this is how to deal with problems. Always be arrogant and um, drink too much. And play with fire. No. So everybody goes over and try to rescue him. Like, almost everybody's standing below him with, like, a big sheet or something to catch him. But he's so cowardly that he won't, even though the flames are about to consume him. I don't know that he's cowardly. I think he's just arrogant again, because he's, like, resigned himself to death and says he's he'd sooner fry. <laughs> what, because of his poverty? I think more that I think it's just a combination of him being drunk, thinking everybody hates him, he's lost everything... I think he's just ready to be done with life. <laughs> well, that's great. <laughs> okay. But Rat and Mole sneak in through the secret entrance and go up and shove him off the balcony to safety. As good friends do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so then everything is burning. Toad says he has no insurance. It's a waste of money. <laughs> in line with his good sense so far this movie. 
So basically, he has literally nothing. But then, magically, <laughs> the letter that Ratty found earlier in the movie. Because his good character <laughs> beggars redemption. <laughs> The letter says his American cousin Bufo has died and left him five million dollars. And he really stops to mourn for cousin Bufo <laughs> without gleefully skipping straight to all the money he's just gotten. Ha ha. So that everybody's like celebrating as Toad Hall collapses in ashes. <laughs> <laughs> the end. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. So then we go back to Vanessa Redgrave and her grandchildren as they finish their tea and they have to leave. And then you get more voiceover over the credits. And then I don't know if you stayed to watch, but there was a I brief did. after credit scene where she's like, dancing and singing about Toad. I did watch it. It would give me a pat on the back. <laughs> I wasn't expecting an after credit scene with this movie. I thought maybe there would be like a line or something. I was waiting for another line from Edward talking about a sequel. <laughs> oh no. So yeah. Definitely recommend... Yeah, the, the watching this once was enough. <laughs> I watched the first one twice, and I would watch it again. It was lovely. Mm -hmm. But this one was... It's one of those where I felt frustrated watching it. Mm -hmm. I was getting so irritated and frustrated watching it. And it's not the end of the world, but some... But every once in a while, I'll see a plot line where I just feel frustrated. And it would be nicer if I was just laughing over it, but I wasn't doing as much of that as I could have. <laughs> No, it, yeah, it was frustrating as a good word, but I don't know. There was something about the way Toad acted that did make me laugh a lot. That's good, because I think it just mostly frustrated me and I wanted him dead. <laughs> <laughs> Not the whole time, but... I, I would have preferred if they had written it more in line with the ending of the first one with him trying to reform instead of completely reverting him back even worse than his right. pre-motor car self. Like, with these characters, there is room for fan fiction. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was only one book, but they have such interesting little personalities, and it's a whole world. And I could buy that Toad gets obsessed with something, even if he's reformed. I could, I definitely could buy him getting obsessed with airplanes. But they totally could have had his character develop even more to where he's actually something besides obnoxious and pleasant. Mm -hmm. Like, say, Badger gets injured or something and needs to be rescued and Toad actually makes himself incredibly useful. Yeah. Or, you know... And doesn't beat up his pilot so that he can get all the glory for himself. <laughs> Or developing, or having little bird characters, or, or yeah, all sorts of. I'm sure there are all sorts of things that you could do with this besides killing everybody off, but not killing them off and burning Toad Hall down, <laughs> and having people get drunk and carry on with the, the house help and whatever. Mm -hmm. Even if they'd had him do the the full reversion to being obnoxiously awful. I still think they could have saved the ending by not having him just get bailed out at the end by the mysterious dead cousin. <laughs> just have him lose everything, because that's more interesting. And just have, like, a little cottage where he lives peacefully and actually learns to be content and yeah. enjoy life quietly. Yeah. Or maybe he could take to see. <laughs> <laughs> there were options. Mm -hmm. And there you have it. <laughs> he bur it burned down, he got a lot of money, and oh boy. <laughs> okay, well, that's all for that one. You've been told. <laughs> Do you want to let people know where they can find you if they want more from you? I am Turnip Wilson on Redbubble. I have things on other sites, but that's where I have the bulk of my artwork where you can see little whimsical animals and vintage style illustration and be in line with these type of stories. All right. Okay. 
Well, we will see you next time. All right. Bye. Thanks for listening to every version ever. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to subscribe and follow my co-hosts as well. My link tree and all of our links will be in the description below. If you want more of my content, all my podcasts are available on YouTube as well as most podcast platforms. If you enjoyed this show, check out one of the other podcasts or check out my Patreon for bonus and extended episodes you won't find anywhere else. We'll be back soon with another brand new episode, so thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.